Okay. Buhi dans es. Uh, we talked about natural numbers last time, about piano axioms. And some of you might remember that there was a tricky word piano used, a word set. Yes. So um, the notion of set, he used the term set, classe in his language, but nevertheless set. And the interesting fact that mathematicians used words set freely, but they didn't quite know what they meant. And there was an old firm sort of idea that you have to avoid actual infinities, that nothing good will come out of meddling with them. That was, for example, one advice Gauss was giving mathematicians. Stay away from infinities. There is nothing good there. And uh, the question is that, of course, you know, when you deal with natural numbers, there is a potential infinity. If you have number n, it's likely there is a number n plus 1. Is it certain? Well, we don't know. We haven't tried them all. There is an important thing to remember, that our experience with large numbers is somewhat limited in terms of adding one to them. Right? But mathematicians sort of assumed that you could keep adding one, that the success operation is always defined. But they were quite uncertain whether you could take the entire set, bunch, whatever you want to call it, of natural numbers and treat them as an object and do operations on them. That was viewed as something dangerous, right? And uh, as a matter of fact, it's still dangerous, except where, you, where we're sort of not seeing it anymore. The danger is no longer present. The sense of staying away from infinity somehow have been sort of eliminated since they started the fifth grade to talking about infinite set. You sort of say, well, I know what, what it is. And let us see how this idea of infinite sets developed historically. Greeks, of course, had firm, a profound mistrust of infinities. They tried to sort of do finitistic mathematics, sort of all the construction operation, whether in geometry or in arithmetic, had to be done with finite number of steps, no infinities. They, they sort of ignored, ignored this path completely. The first attempts to treat infinity as an object actually goes back fairly far. You know, normally, if you ask somebody who's supposed to know, they say, well, Cantor invented infinite sets and one-to-one -one correspondence. No, it goes way, 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 way back uh, from Cantor. And it actually first appears, and there is even s some potential precursors even before that uh, in 14th century. There is a great name, which you, of course, never heard, Nicole Orem. He was a Frenchman. So you don't say Oresme, you say Orem. And uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful fellow. Uh, he lived in a difficult time. 14th century was a very great century in some respects, but one of the most terrible centuries in the history of Europe. Because you see, when he turns 30, Roughly half of the population of Europe dies, Black Plague. And in France, and especially in Paris, it's likely more than half. So if you imagine a country losing more than half, maybe 70% of its population. And again, uh, he's a priest. And among his colleagues, among priests and monks, 
the death rate is far higher because they go and they help the sick and they die. Uh, in France, probably 90% of the clergy uh, disappears. But nevertheless, it's a great period. There are some, some new ideas. In Europe, every century, you have some new great idea. And there are very great people before him in France who teach him. Of course, there is a, one of the greatest logicians of all the time, uh, sort of passes all the time through France, William of Ockham, some name you should have heard. Uh, I wish I had time to talk about him. I don't. Jean Buridan, the, the, the guy with the nest, remember? Also a fantastic logician. Uh, works and probably teaches O.M. Uh, because he's a, a rector of Sorbonne, the president of the greatest university. Sorbonne at that time is the greatest university in the world. But then again, things get sort of there, there are all kinds of other ideas. There are some strange Italians who write strange books. Two great books written in 14th century. Okay, early on, of course, there is Dante. You heard of Dante. But then smack while O.M. is, is uh, around, there are two great Italians, one of whom is constantly in France and affects sort of French intellectual life. Great. Greatly, first is Giovanni Boccaccio, who writes the most important collection of uh, somewhat mildly absurd stories, on which Shakespeare later on bases his many of his plays. Uh, maybe you're old enough by now to read him, uh, so uh, if you haven't, you should. And then, of course, a great Italian poet, Francesca Petrarca. It's again the same same vibes in the 14th century sort of start this Renaissance movement. The great classic Middle Ages of the 13th century are over. New vibes are there. And Arem is part of this thing. And again, he lives in France with the greatest university. Of course, the Pope lives in France. Right? Because there is this strange period of what is known as Babylonian captivity, when the Pope is taken and put in Avignon and becomes sort of a puppet of a French king. Uh, well, toward the end of the century, of course, the things dramatically improved. There are three popes. Well, first there are two popes and three popes. There is a great season. Uh, then, right before the plague comes, another terrible thing happens. English come. You know, there is this great invasion of France by Edward III. He starts this little war known as a hundred year war, a long war. So France is decimated. They, they lose two great battles of Crissy and Poitiers. And uh, sort of things, things are strange. Then, of course, uh, when he becomes, Orien becomes old, France reestablishes itself with a very, very good king, uh, Charles V, uh, sort of they take back most of the land. And Orem becomes an important friend of the king, sort of being sort of a clever person. He's appreciated. And again, king actually asks him to do something for him. And that's, that's a remarkable thing. Uh, you know, France is fighting for its life. And the king asks the greatest scientist in the kingdom to do something. What does he ask him to do? Design a weapon? To do something? No. He asks him to translate Aristotle to French. You see, this, this is the first time somebody comes with an idea that you should translate great books, scientific books, because he translates Aristotle logic and metaphysics and ethics uh, into French from Latin. He doesn't know Greek. Uh, so again, Ariam is, is sort of one of the greatest people in the history of French language since he was the first person to attempt to write something other than ditties, other than some verses in, in French. Uh, but he did many more wonderful things. OK, that's a short list of. Is, is that the picture of him supposed to be him translating his writing?
This is a picture from one of his manuscripts, uh, from one of his books. So this is a scribe's representation of Orem writing the book. So how, you know, that's the best portrait I was able to find. It's pretty good, but, uh, and it is contemporary. It's, I mean, it's literally written by, by a scribe who, who, who was sort of inscribing, inscribing his book. And I thought it was quite pretty. So let's see what he did. I mean, first of all, he was the first person, actually, long before Descartes, who introduced Cartesian coordinates. He was studying uh, physics, and he, he discovered that to describe certain sort of physical events, he needed coordinate system and started using x and y. I mean, not a bad thing. He discovered a very important thing. I mean, he either discovered there was a Merton College at Oxford, which had a bunch of sort of pretty good physicists, too, who discovered the fact that if something drops, it accelerates at a constant rate. And more importantly, it uh, sort of to, to find its average velocity. You need to look at the velocity, the speed, at the middle of this interval. If the thing f falls for 10 seconds, the average velocity is going to be the velocity at, at 5 seconds, right? which allows you then to compute, compute the length. So again, uh, and he did, he did quite wonderful work on, on that. Uh, he, uh, at the end of his life, he wrote the first treatise on economics where he introduced several very important ideas, which are still controversial. Uh, he introduced an important law, uh, which is known as Orem law, which says that if you have two currencies competing in the market, the, the bad currency wins, which sort of the good currency is going to be sort of taken out uh, first. And second of all, he introduced monetarism. Well, you say Milton Friedman. No, it wasn't Milton Friedman. It was actually Nicole Rehm. That is, he observed that kings, including his friend, Charles V, used currency as a way of getting revenues. Sort of, you decrease the amount of gold and coinage, and by that, you get more money. I don't know, printing money, effectively. And he came up with a rather controversial idea, politically very dangerous, till today, that uh, government actually is not in shouldn't be in charge of money. The society should be in charge of money. Government must tax. If they want money, they have to tax, not to debase the currency. You understand that even today, it is a very controversial idea. So the fact that he, he sort of discovered all of that and wrote it down, it is quite remarkable. So what's about infinity? Coming to infinity. So let us see what he did in mathematics. He's just such a remarkable guy. I, I had to tell you a few things, especially, again, you probably would never hear about him otherwise. They, they hide people like that from, from you. OK. He was the first person who started dealing with infinite series, infinite series as an explicit object. Of course, Archimedes was doing integration, but he was doing it geometrically. It wasn't the arithmetic operation. So he was the first person who said, what if we, say, take this sort of the sum from 1 to infinity of i over 2 to the i minus 1. Well, in other words, 1 plus 2 times 1 over 2, 3 times over 4, and so on. Do you see the pattern? And he proves, actually proves, not, not just guesses, that it's 4. Uh, again, you know, I, for, a, for a little while I thought, why don't I give it as a homework problem? But then I sort of decided, well, 
these guys are not going to do it, and they will never learn one of the prettiest proofs in mathematics. So let us try to do it. Step one, we write it like that. Yeah? It's just writing it like that. Then we observe that we could write it in this way. We could leave one guy here. Then we have one guy shifted by one. We have two halves, and we have three fourths, and we have four fifths, and we have uh, not fifth. Uh, we have uh, uh, five eighths, and we have you 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 see you see the pattern. So we could write it like that. Everybody agrees. So he did, and then. He observes the following thing, that he could, again, let's just go back, he could take one out of parentheses here, one half here, one fourth here, one eighth here, one sixteenth, one, I mean, he knew powers of two. So that's what you get, yes? So this is the same. And it is equal to what? Two. That was known probably to the Greeks. Right? So you get this times this. Two times two. Very nice. Very nice. You know, and the fact that a guy in 14th century while doing all this other stuff, translating Aristotle, inventing monetarism and economics, you know, also do this, it's pretty impressive. And then, for example, he first comes with a sort of, he can deal with convergent series. Now he demonstrates again for the first time the way to analyze a divergent series. There is a very important series known as harmonic series. 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4. Does it converge, diverge, whatever? Nobody knew. So, again, Ohem was the first person who came up with a beautiful, beautiful proof saying that, well, it diverges. Why? Because you could write it as 1 plus 1 half, yes? Plus two next numbers up to one-fourth, four next numbers up to one-eighth, and, pardon me? Okay, but, but you understand, so, so you keep going on. Every, every two to the n bunch of numbers gives you something bigger than one-half, and how many of them do we have? Well, infinity. Therefore, it will go, well, if we go up to here, it will get to be greater than n over 2. But then we could go as many, I mean, for any n, we could find this decomposition. Again, it's a remarkable, remarkable result, which led him to another thing. So he was the first person who said, again, some people, th this is difficult Thing, but I have to, since I'm saying something, I have to tell you that there is at least one uh, modern uh, scholar, uh, Adrian Moore at Oxford, very, very famous and distinguished, who claims that there is similar passages in Dun Scotus. I was not able to find them. So this is whatever. The, I still stick to what, what I know. That, uh, uh, he is the first person, and this is a common opinion here, I'm quoting a fairly reputable source, Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy, that Oram introduces principle of one-to-one -one correspondence as a way of how you measure the cardinality, which one is bigger. How do we determine that there are sort of equal number of people on both sides by putting them into one-to-one -one correspondence. If we cannot, if we run out, the side on which we run out 
is greater. So this is this idea of one-to-one -one correspondence is a way of measuring cardinality, and Rem comes up with it, and specifically he observes that uh, there is as many odd numbers as uh, natural numbers, which, which is a sort of controversial thing, difficult thing. Remember, Euclid even had an axiom that the whole is greater than its part. And here it seems that he breaks it, sort of it starts a chain of thought, and people keep discussing it. It never disappears. But time passes, so it's 14th century. We have somebody writing about it. And there are some allusions to it in 15th century in the works of uh, Nicholas of Cusa, uh, sort of a wonderful, wonderful sort of Neoplatonic philosopher, uh, uh, sort of in the works of Nicholas of Cusa. But then at the end of 16th, in the beginning of 17th century comes another person who does a lot of stuff and brings it back to, to people's attention. And the person is Galileo. Uh, the difficulty with Galileo is that, you know, while I could talk a lot about Torem, we actually know very little about him. About Galileo, we, we know unbelievable amount of stuff. So if you don't know about Galileo, learn. Uh, probably the easiest book we, to learn about him is a, a sort of a historical book written by Donna Sabell, a very capable American historical writer, called Galileo's Daughter. It's not about Galileo, it's about his daughter. But of course, it sort of brings Galileo alive much better than any other book I know. Uh, sort of a self-made man, sort of grows in a fairly limited circumstances. His father wants him to become a doctor under no circumstances, study mathematics. Why? Yeah, exactly. Mathematicians are not paid well. So this is still true. I mean, things hasn't changed. But he, he actually doesn't listen to his father and does very well. So this is one of the few examples of a mathematician sort of making good money. Uh, well, he is a wonderful writer and uh, very quickly attracts attention of all kinds of important people. Most importantly, he, at first, he attracts attention of uh, the Medici Duke of Florence, who gives him a court appointment. Court appointment is good because you get paid and you could sort of lead a good life, buy a nice villa next to Florence. He does all of that, sort of, and only because he names some moons of Jupiter, which he discovers, for the duke. This is, remember, it works wonders. If you discover some moons, name them Jeff. Uh, can, will lead to good things. So, and uh, the uh, sort of, eventually he even acquires a greater friend. He becomes a friend of certain Urban the Eighth, the Pope. A Barbarini Pope. Uh, seemingly wonderful guy, uh, an intellectual, writes poetry, uh, very good looking, but chaste, uh, has one great weakness. Uh, weakness which was plagued Catholic Church for several centuries, called nepotism. What does it mean? It means that you love your nephews too much, and you make them very, very important. And he does that. He basically decides to make Barberini clan into sort of royalty, makes two of his nephews cardinal, uh, makes his brother a cardinal, makes another brother a general of the papal armies, gets into all kind of 
political things because of uh, uh, his family. Uh, spends 23 years on the throne, it's a long time, and Barberini has become very important. Sort of still in Rome, you see many palaces, uh, and there is a historically very famous uh, Today is my bad day, guys. Uh, every family has a crest thing. Uh, Barberini crest with three Bs. Sort of you, historically important. And witty Romans, Romans were very witty, uh, come up with a ditty saying that what barbarians could not do, Barberinis did. Uh, because Barberini, the Pope Barberini, uh, take some very important bronze beams from Pantheon, which is a great Roman building, and reuses them for some of his uh, stuff in St. Peter's. So whatever barbarians could not do, Barberini can. He is Galileo's friend. Well, again, being a friend of important people is dangerous, especially if you do the following thing. Sort of apparently, the Pope asks Galileo to write a dialogue about Copernican system and uh, even express his pope's point of view, which happens to be Aristotelian point of view. The earth is in the center, which is perfectly all right. He's entitled to his point of view. Galileo, of course, does a very, very uh, strange thing. Uh, he decides to. Uh, call the representative of the Pope in this dialogue Simplicio, a simpleton, and assign to him some really stupid sayings. Pope wasn't stupid, but he was quite vain. And things start. So whatever you do, do not, uh, I make fun of all important people all the time, but that's why I'm here. Uh, so there, sort of, he gets in trouble. And uh, again, he wrote enormous amount of books, 20, 20 books. Uh, the one he got in trouble is dialogue concerning the two chief world system, Copernican and Ptolemy system. Uh, very famous book, but it's actually not as good as all of that because he actually doesn't quite get it. There is another guy in Vienna who gets it, whose name is Kepler. You see, Kepler discovers that it all goes in elliptic orbits, and Galileo insists that they must be circles. He actually gets it wrong. But he gets in trouble. Kepler doesn't get in trouble. He becomes famous. But if you want to read something by Galileo, which at least one book is clearly worth reading, is his second book. After he is condemned and you know, put into this terrible jail called his villa, it wasn't that bad. Uh, he writes, he's an old man, he writes this great book called Dialogues Concerning Two New Sciences, which, according to Einstein, is the beginning of physics. And according to me, it is the beginning of physics, too. It is a very great book. So, and Galileo, in both of his books, in all his books, writes beautifully. So he's a great writer, and it's highly, I mean, but I highly recommend the second, not the first one. Uh, the first one, if you want to read about sort of this stuff, read Kepler, Epitome of Copernican System. It's a very great book. Uh, dialogue Concerning Two New Sciences deals basically with two, uh, two sciences. The science of material. He discovers that you cannot take, say, a squirrel and make it proportionally 10 times as large. It bones will break. Right? That is, there is no possibility. For example, a human being 20 foot tall is going to, to, to be in big, big trouble. His bones will collapse. So he discovers, this is, by the way, how the book looks uh, in, in its first edition. I already told you how it was published. 
You probably forgot. There was this guy, I remember, in Paris called Marine Marsan. Remember Marsan? He was the center of all this scientific community. So Galileo sent it to him because he couldn't publish it in Italy. He's sort of in trouble. So he sends it to Paris. Mersenne sort of finds a good publisher in Holland, and the books come out. So uh, I was planning to tell you that, look, it was published by Elsevier. It was. And Elsevier, even now, is one of the most important scientific publishers, except I check my sources. And last week, when I was checking this slide, I discovered that this is not the same publisher. The old publisher stopped publishing in, uh, at the end, effectively at the end of 17th century. And at the end of 19th century, somebody started a new publishing house, naming it after the, after the original. So my beautiful story is gone. Uh, OK, so two sciences, strength of material, square cube law of, and then laws of motion, uniform acceleration of falling body, tra trajectory of projectiles. They go into parallel, beautiful stuff. In, in some sense, one Einstein says that's the foundation of physics. It is, the, I mean, Galileo principle, the idea that the, uh, it's a bad day. The, uh, the invariancy of the uh, coordinate system, sort of, that you could change coordinate system, but the laws of physics will be the same. It's fundamental. It's actually sort of, as Einstein said, that's where relativity theory fundamentally comes from, from this uh, Galileo principle. But, among other things, he also decides to talk about infinity. And I couldn't resist to give you a direct quote from the book. That one of the difficulties which arise when we attempt with our finite minds to discuss the infinite, assigning to it those properties which we give to the finite and limited. That is, we have to remember our minds are finite, our, all of our experience is finite, and we try to carry it to infinity. So it's a very, very profound sort of idea. But this, I think, is wrong, for we cannot speak of infinite quantities as being the one greater or less than or equal to another. Again, while he fully elaborates one-to-one -one correspondence, he says, our intuition there doesn't really work. And what he shows, he takes an example. I, I decided here, just use annotation instead of quoting, uh, that we could map all the numbers to all square numbers. He, as every decent mathematician, is Pythagorean. So he remembers about square numbers. And he says, look, I could map this to this. And he shows how to map them. And then he says, but observe the following thing. Every further we go, fewer numbers we have. Because you know, the number of square numbers gets less and less dense. So if we go to infinity, the frequency goes down to zero. But on the other hand, there is one-to-one -one correspondence. There is this paradoxical thing. Again, he discusses at length, and again, I gave you the quote. He says, our intuition is broken. We cannot rely on our judgment based on finite things when we talk about infinity. So, but again, wa wonderful passage from a wonderful, wonderful book. So I'm putting a sort of, if you want to, to buy one book by Galileo, that's the book. It's worth buying, worth reading. goes down to zero. That's what he writes. So here I couldn't resist jump to twentieth century and introduce another paradox, very, very beautiful, 
known as Littlewood Paradox. I mentioned uh, this wonderful little book by uh, Littlewood called Mathematician's Miscellany in the first journey. And this is from the f page number five, the very beginning, this wonderful paradox. I mean, we take a vase or a box and one minute before midnight or before noon, noon he says, whatever, it doesn't matter, it works in both cases. Uh, we drop one number and remove one. Then, uh, uh, and uh, we drop 10, remove 1. Then we drop 20 and remove 2. Then we drop from, you know, so. Always drop 10 and remove 1. Yes, so that, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, so we drop from 10 to 20 and remove 2. We drop, I mean, we drop 10 more and, and, and it, it says it here, guys. Yes. So I'm trying to read the slide without looking. And apparently, it's difficult. Uh, so some, somehow, it goes on forever and so on. So how many balls will be in the box at noon? It appears to be that every closer we get, more balls we have, right? But on the other hand, there is this tricky problem that for every ball with any number, there is some time before noon when it will be taken out. Do you agree? So it will be empty. So there is this amazing fact the number of balls grows but when you reach none there's nothing left one of the paradoxes of infinity again when we deal with infinite reasoning things happen like that you know you assemble more and more it's like Larry Ellison he collects more and more money and when he dies it's all gone because, you know, legally speaking, dead people cannot, cannot own any property. That's, that's the law of the land. So the same idea. So, uh, little one. I have to sort of, again, what I'm trying to tell you that part of the story, that as we go, at every moment there is this, idea of infinity comes back and is revisited and revisited and revisited and revisited. And there are all kind of wonderful people who revisit it. They're not, they're not shabby people. And another person of whom you, I'm sure, never heard is Bernard Bolzano. Huh? Sounds Italian, but he wasn't. He was an Austrian, Hungarian, but he was a Czech. He lived in Prague, uh, comes from his father, Bolzano, was from German-speaking part of Italy. There is such a thing, Trento, you know, around Trento, yes? Uh, but he moved, at that time, of course, part of Austria, Hungary. So he moves there to Prague, and his mother uh, is a German-speaking person. So he's a German-speaking Czech. It's a very, very important thing because, you know, at that time there were some first-class languages and there were second-class languages. And Czech was a second-class language. We will see. Bolzano was one of the major people. Uh, so he grows up in these interesting times when he's, say, uh, 22. What happens in Vienna? Napoleon happens in Vienna, right? Sort of this, Vienna is conquered by the French, all these French ideas come, and there, from that point on, for the next 12, 13 years, there's unstoppable wars. Armies march back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And um, 
he's a very capable, quiet boy from uh, a poor family, uh, gets to university and does not know what to do. And then somebody says that if you want to do good, it, you should try to influence people to do good. And you could do it if you become a priest. So he becomes a priest with this explicit idea of doing good. And uh, he's ordained and becomes the professor of uh, religious studies in the University of Prague. And he starts sort of writing things and preaching. Uh, and what he preaches is very, very strange. Uh, uh, he says, for example, that it's very bad that societies now train their people to hate each other and kill each other. This is really has to stop. We have to learn to, to love each other. And we have to have peace. And it's the task of the church, the task of the universities, to make people love peace. First idea. The second idea with which he comes, uh, this I'm going to get in trouble for telling you that, is the idea, he says, it's, we should hope that one day there will be a society where they will not be very rich and very poor, and where some people will control all the wealth and other people will struggle for existence. The society must come where everybody would live like brothers and share what they have. Trust me. I mean, this is not to be said. I mean, they will put you in tar and feather in just about any society for that. And, uh, but he keeps saying it. For about 15 years, actually, nothing happens. And then he says, let me tell you another sort of amazing thing he says. He says that we have to treat Jews the way we treat each other. Again, the idea seems to be self-evident, but it wasn't. Right? And then we are accustomed to that. that treating Jews now seems to be an accepted thing. But then he says, we should allow everybody, whatever language he speaks, even if he speaks Czech, to go to university and study and become. So all of these ideas, sort of, it's actually what so far, I mean, you say, well, we, we, we heard some of them. Well, maybe. But uh, you know, at that time, they were utterly novel. And uh, he actually preaches them. And according to the, the record, lots of people come to hear his sermons. For example, sometimes attendance reaches 1,000 people. 1,000 people is a lot. Uh, well, eventually, the emperor of France hears about these sayings. So, and uh, obviously, that cannot continue. So he's f thrown out of the university, forbidden to preach. Uh, the archbishop is told to sort of investigate his heretical things. Fortunately, Archbishop is his friend and nothing happens. But he is left with a tiny stipend uh, to, to just live. Uh, and no possibility to publish, no possibility to talk. So the emperor spoke. Uh, and he decides to do some mathematics. He already was, I mean, very good mathematician by that time. He starts doing mathematics and logic and philosophy. So all of that without being able to publish. Fortunately, there are a couple of people who, who sort of willing to, to help him. So he could he lives in fairly decent, decent, decent style. And he's quite frugal. So what does he invent? Well, okay. He invents this infamous epsilon delta definition of continuity. Because prior to that, analysis, calculus, was based on infinitesimals. Very unsolid because, you know, what are infinitesimals? So he comes up with some of you took some calculus. Well, uh, so you have seen epsilon delta. He invented epsilon delta. Later on, Kashiri invents it. And because she was a very great mathematician, no question about it. But the priority clearly comes to Bolzano. He de develops sort of modern foundation for calculus quite independently. And later on, by the way, his work, when sort of eventually it's published, some of it after his death, 
and eventually rediscovered by Karl Weierstrass, a great German mathematician in Berlin who sort of studies his work and creates modern foundation of analysis. But remarkable work. For example, you know, balzana weierstrass theorem, it was proved by Balzana, the idea that every bounded sequence has a condensation point, has a limit. Right? Uh, and uh, intermediate value theorem. If you have a function going from minus to plus, it will stop at zero. Well, for or any, any intermediate value. Again, he comes up with the proof. You say, well, but I read it in calculus. That's why you read it in calculus, because he proved it. Okay? The notion of uniform convergence. Remember that uniform convergence is a sort of a sequence where for every epsilon greater than zero, you could find n some far, far, far down that the distance between every two guys past this n is less than epsilon. So again, very, very delicate, wonderful idea of uniform convergence done by. And then he writes a wonderful book called Paradoxes of Infinite. So he again says we need to study infinities. And then he writes the book on all wisdom, sort of, a, sort of one of the greatest books on logic ever, ever written. Again, it takes a while till it's sort of understood. Most of his, right now he is famous again. The stamp proves that he is famous. We don't put him on the stamp. But uh, it takes a while till people like Husserl and Gödel, for example, start reading his logical work. Uh, you, you will see why. But it, uh, originally, so, uh, so first of all, he comes up with this treatment of, of uh, the infinite, explicitly defining this one-to-one -one correspondence. He comes with the term one-to-one -one correspondence, which, which sort of becomes central for, for further development. And he just shows, for example, proves that for any two intervals, from 0 to 5 and 0 to 12, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. It gives a function. So he starts, he starts treating that. Uh, then he comes up with this remarkable thing. It's uh, commonly known as Dedic indexium, but it actually goes back to Balzana. And now we know that actually Dedic learned it from Balzana. The idea is that what is an infinite thing? The infinite thing is the thing which could be with one-to-one -one correspondence with its proper subset. That's the, the way you, you define what, I mean, because finite things cannot be in one-to-one. -one. I mean, you only have seven apples and put them into one-to-one -one correspondence with five. It just doesn't work. But you could do it with infinite sets. And he realizes that that is the definition of infinity. Right? Again, his work is absolutely fundamental. And here, I'm very late. I might not finish the lecture, but let's have a break.